Yo, 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 what it do? Welcome to another episode of the Task Cast live from Dubai. You guys know my partners in crime. We got Timmy, we got Ali. How you guys doing? Yeah, very well. How are you, Tim? Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. Hey, how are you doing, Kareem? Good, good, <laughs> good. Tim. Yeah. And today, what did you say? I got your name wrong. I called you Tim. We just started. <laughs> the oh, bald we guys, can get mixed guys. up. We can get a, mixed it's up. It's about to get more confusing because we got is. another bald brother joining us today. <laughs> we got Abdurrahman or Zilia joining us today. How, how you doing, are you doing, man? You good? Yeah, alhamdulillah, man. So glad to have you. Thank you so much for coming on. I just realized we could play a game, pick the odd one out. Yeah, yeah. So many games with bald heads. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he's the tallest one, so he'll just squash us anyway. Exactly. Doesn't matter. We're a little intimidated by him. So uh, we've got uh, Abdurrahman on today just to talk a little bit about recruitment and job growth here in the UAE. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you've got your own company that you've started, do, yeah. uh, ARC Talent, yeah, if that's, that's correct, right. if I remember correctly. Arc Talent, yeah. Oh, you just pronounced it Arc Talent? It is, yeah. Okay, I'm so sorry. Either so way. sorry. All right. That's cool. all right. It works. I told Don't you I listened to it. your podcast. I really did. I really, I'm, I'm failing myself so bad. I'm like, what's your name? What's the name of your podcast? And yeah, yeah mashallah, you have your own podcast as well called Steering Success. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, awesome, yeah. awesome. So, so it's what nice is, to be on the other side for a change. Yeah, cool, this cool. Glad, yeah. To, glad to have you on the other side, man. Truly, yeah. truly. Um, you want to tell us a little bit about uh, your, your history, your podcast, what Arc Talent is? Yeah, sure. So I've been doing uh, recruitment, talent acquisition, HR for over 20 years. Last nine years here in the Middle East, in the UAE. Uh, run my own agency for the last almost five years and recently launched my podcast called Steering Success, which is tailored towards conversations with exceptional leaders in the industry, whether it's in HR or just founders and leaders in tech. Got you. It's, it's all about business, entrepreneurship. Yeah, it's your... about building a business, scaling a business, how to do it right, what works, leadership styles and so forth, and more importantly, the human element of business. And is that what your company is about as well? Or like, uh, is yeah. it like, hey, I want to get a job, Abdurrahman, can you help me get a job? Or... You know, it's, it's probably the worst job to have when you go to a dinner party because when people <laughs> find out um, uh, what you do, the first thing they say is, oh, I need a job or I know someone who needs a job. Right, so right. it's not necessarily that, right? So we're headhunters. So we find unique set of skills for people or for companies. So they, they come to us and say, we need to find this specific sort of person. Where can I find them from? And so forth. And then we do global searches and find them all around the world. Then bring them either here to the UAE or to Saudi, or we get them to work remote. So are, are, there, any, you, yeah, are, go there, ahead. are there any specific roles that are most difficult to fill? Any specific talents that you have trouble filling? Anything in tech now is hard. So what, because cyber security? Cyber, you know, crypto, you know, even just basic software engineer roles, they're hard. Why? Because everyone's going after them. So everyone wants them. So what do you do in that situation? Do you have to, do you find the most appealing package to get the best candidates? Yeah, that's probably the worst way to do it because it's very short-sighted. So it's more about finding and understanding what the company is and, and who they represent and what sort of culture they have and then selling that as the best opportunity. So coming into an organization, which I'm sure we'll probably dig into later, moving abroad isn't just about the package that you're mm. getting, it's about the company that you're joining and the people that you're working with. Right? Absolutely. So it's a big risk. You, you need to be yeah. you know, fully aware of what you're actually walking into, and I'll, and I'll definitely share you yeah. a horror story or two <laughs> of, uh, of my experiences. I've done a man, you're a fellow Aussie. I am, right. yeah. So obviously Ooh. your history started in Australia. <laughs> so tell us about boo. the difference. Hey man, it's not going to do another American versus Aussie here. America's always boo. That's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. I always do the spit. You know? yeah. <laughs> but tell us about, like, obviously you started off in Australia. You are born in Australia. Yeah, that's right. Okay. And, you know, you lived most of your teen yeah, 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 life. Yeah. So tell us the difference. Tell us your journey from how you started in Australia and then why the move? Yeah, to look, the UAE because we all have interesting stories about yeah. well, why we moved to the UAE. Well, especially you moved really early on, right? So not it's not not well, part of the recent trend. So I actually was asked this on a podcast um, about six months ago as well, right? When my journey and so forth. And my name's Abdul Rahman. I, I'm a Muslim growing up in uh, in Oz. is is never easy, right? Um, I changed my name in Oz to a more Western name. My name was Jay for like, 15 years, wow. right? Because people just didn't respond to me calling them by, and, and me saying, my name's Abdurrahman, do you want to do business and so forth, right? So that was quite difficult. Um, I wouldn't know. And then growing up, <laughs> growing up, you know, in a, in a culture where the corporate world and the business world is very driven by client entertainment and wine and, you know, yeah. just, you know, alcoholic functions and so forth, it was very difficult for me to sort of find my place. And then I kind of lost my way for a very long time as well, right? Okay. So when you 
put all that together and then try and find yourself and, and who you are and what your place is in, the, in this world. And then when you finally do that, you realize, well, maybe this isn't the place for me, right? Yeah. So um, we, my wife and I, I was probably just two years married when, uh, when we started looking at something else abroad. Okay. Um, I was working for a larger multinational, a 15 billion turnover business in, uh, in Oz um, back then. And I was going to take a job in uh, Manhattan which was, which would have been, you know, fantastic. And then I could have booed you guys, <laughs> you know, and, um, and as I accepted the offer and so forth, my wife and I were saying, okay, how, how are we going to tell the family and whatnot? And then someone reached out to me and headhunted me from Dubai. Nice. Okay. And I was like, okay, well, you know what, Muslim country, you know, tax free as well. And if I'm going to do this and leave family and friends, then I might as well do it for a bit of a cash grab and go somewhere where I'm comfortable, where yep. there's mosques and it's a yep. bit of a freedom for me to actually be who I wanted to be. So yeah. had you visited Dubai yeah, before that? that? Well, I actually had an offer, what, eight years beforehand. So when I was like 27 years old, um, I got an offer here, I accepted, had a going away party in Oz. And then four days before I was meant to jump on a flight, I decided to change my arm to stay in Oz and Changed my mind. Right? I just so wanted to have a going away party, get all the gifts. It and was then... a great party. Too, right? yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, um, uh, so that was good. But just, um, I probably wasn't in the right headspace to move abroad and move away from the, from the surroundings that would protect me from the, from the bad in the world, right? So yeah. in the end, stayed, did my time, but probably that subconscious, that, that itch that I didn't scratch, yeah. right? So whenever there was an opportunity to even think about that again, I thought, you know what? Let's go ahead and do this. And I was lucky enough that my wife, prior to meeting me, she had traveled to Dubai as well and she nice. was a fan. So that obviously ticked off the box. Wow. Nice. Awesome. Awesome. And you're happy with the decision, I'm sure? <laughs> Mate, when I, when I moved here, and this is why I was quite intrigued from your sort of invitation to this podcast, right? Yeah. Because the move abroad is never easy, right? Yeah. And I moved here. The company that actually headhunted me, I actually did them over and I went somewhere else in the end. So I signed contracts with them and as I was flying here to actually sign contracts with them. I had dinner with them and so forth. And someone else headhunted me during that process. Wow. And, and wow. they paid me 15K more than what the other company was paying, right? So, and I was thinking, well, that's, that's like 6,000 yeah. Aussie dollars yeah. a month in yeah. my pocket. I'm thinking, that's, that's just a lot ridiculous. of money. Yeah, Tax yeah. free as that's, well. I can't walk away from that. Sort yeah, of thing, yeah, right? sure. So I went to, to, the, to the first company and I said, can you match it? I, I don't want more, just match it. Because you're a better company, but they're paying me a ridiculous amount of money, right? right. They couldn't match it, and I said, I have to take this. So I took the money. I kid you not, mate. It was the worst experience of my life. Wow. I can imagine. Why? Tell us, tell us why. The, and, and there were two Aussies. The, yeah. the yeah. two um, owners of the company were, were Aussies. Boo. Right? <laughs> Just horrible. I was showing you love. Sydney. Sydney. I was showing no, you no, love. No, no, in America, Sydney. we say, oh, no, that's yeah. my boo. That's my boo. <laughs> that's what I was doing. That's you guys is, misunderstood. Right? You know I mean? <laughs> but like, the, it, it was, I lasted probably two and a half months. Wow. Right? And I was like... And you'd flown your wife and... I moved my wife, my six-month-old. Wow. My wife was pregnant two weeks after we landed with our wow. second. And I was like... And then she's telling me, we're going to go home, yeah? And I'm like, no, nah, we're going we're gonna to stick this out. We're here now. Like, yeah, we've yeah. moved everything here and so forth, right? I failed my medical test because I had some scarring in, in my lung, right? They sent me to Mahasana to some sort of uh, labor camp, medical center, whatever the, that's there. And I was going there three or four times... In, in the week, in a taxi, 300 dirhams up, 300 dirhams back, wow. to go to this place. I'm thinking, what? This can't be the process. Yeah. But this was the only process that I knew here, right? right? Because the guys were living in Malta, running a company here, the two Aussie founders so of this no company. Support here, you're by so they had no support here. had zero support at all. Yeah. And I'm like, wow. this, this can't be the Dubai process. Otherwise, people won't stay here. For yeah. sure. It's just horrible, right? And I was like, I'm going to leave. Stuff it. I'm going to go home. I'm like, well, this is not worth it. Right. I'm not working with these guys. The missus was pregnant. I was going to OB appointments, paying out of pocket because I had no visa, no medical insurance. All these things were just piling on. I was just like, no, nah, I'm not going to do it, right? They hadn't reimbursed me for my flights, for the accommodation, the company and so forth. So all these things that I paid out of pocket in the contract, no reimbursements. I said, stuff it. And for the first time in my life, if I was ever to feel depressed, and I'm probably the furthest thing away from that because I can always gain that perspective of life, no matter how hard it is, there's always someone worse. So just move on and, and soldier on. I thought, I'm, I'm now feeling really down right now. Damn. Like this is just like, this is really hard to go into work in an, in, a, in an environment, in a culture that doesn't suit me and my personality and so forth. I'm like, nah. I walked into the office when they were in town. And I said, I'm out. I'm going to resign. They said, oh, you can't because you're on this like, sort of contract. I said, I don't care. I'll forfeit all my money, which was roughly around sort of 170 grand. And I said, I'm out. 
Get me, just get me out of here. And they let me go, obviously, because it was a win for them. Yeah, for sure. And I called the company who I did over. And I called the CEO and towel between my legs, hat in my hand. And I said, <laughs> hey, I've screwed up. I made a big mistake. I shouldn't have joined these guys. I should have joined you. What can you do? And subhanAllah, man, because when the original job he gave me was to be based in Dubai, but run Saudi. Yeah. Right. And, I, and I'll give him a shout out. Dave McKenzie from McKenzie Jones. Okay. Who we don't talk that much anymore. I don't know why he doesn't want to talk to me, but you know, <laughs> another, another podcast episode. Okay. <laughs> but, um, uh, but he's like, um, he's like, oh, I don't know now. That role was meant to be me based here for one week a month and three weeks in Saudi. And now imagine my wife moving here with a six month old, newly pregnant with our second child and me leaving her for three weeks out of the, out of the month, every single month. It's a dream come true for you. Oh, no, sorry, sorry. sorry, sorry, sorry. We'll cut that, we'll cut that part. Exactly, right? So now I'm thinking like, you know, know, but I dodged that bullet, right? I really dodged that bullet. Because then when I I came back to him hat in hand, he's like, I don't know whether I can do this. I met with him a couple of times. He's like, you know, you've burnt some bridges and so forth. But to his credit, and I'll always say this, I owe him, I owe him everything. Mm. He paid the excess on my medical insurance for my wife to have, to have, to have the baby and so forth. He did everything. Right. Right? Then he created a new job. He moved someone in the business out and put me in to run sales marketing and digital for him. And I was like, being based in Dubai every, every day, four, four weeks in a month. I'm like, this is like, subhanAllah, this, is, this, was, this, looking is, for? this was the journey that, was, uh, that I was meant to go through, right? right? Go through that shit to realize what life is yeah. and, and how, how bad it can be when you choose the wrong employer. And then go back to this guy and then stay with yourself and so forth and then be able to do that. So ever since then, I always thought there has to be a better way to be able to relocate people Absolutely. with the duty of care to the human side of actual recruitment because... It is for too long neglected. People don't communicate the onboarding process correctly. They don't let them know what they're in for. It's not as easy as packing up a bag or packing up a suitcase or packing up a family. You're going to a new job, which is hard enough. You're going to a new country, which is hard enough. You go all these things combined. And if you don't give them the support when it comes to visas and medical insurances and everything else, like D1, how do you connect to all these sort of things? It's an absolute shit show. For sure. Yeah. That's what it is. Yeah. So from then, I was always just focused on how can I do this better for the people that I'm bringing from, uh, from abroad to the UAE? So before that whole process, the, the whole recruitment, the art talent, that was never in your mind. It was this process of you going through well, that led you to Well, think- for me, I was always like a company guy, right? So I always joke with my friends who are founders of, of, uh, of companies that typically the entrepreneurs are the ones that are, you know, you know lemonade stands at, at 12 years old and, and starting up businesses at 16, 18, 22 and t- having 16 or 17 failures before they they get it right. I was always happy to work in the company to learn mm. how to do things for the bigger businesses, for the small boutiques, surround myself with, with good people and just absorb, right? Because I was never great at school, but I was always good in a working environment where I could just learn from people on how they actually do their job. So 17 years into my career, did, did I then say, I'm gonna launch my own business? 17, 18 years, right? So that's like a long time for someone to cut his teeth yeah, to of course. A, to actually learn the cable, but there's, right? But I'm there's the more than you, man. But yeah. there's more than one way to do it, right? There's more. That, there is just because one person does it one way and someone else takes a different path, you might end up at the same spot yeah, after yeah, a certain amount of exactly, years, right? Yeah. So exactly. how have you seen the job market change over time? Because how long have you been now in Dubai? This is this is closing on my ninth year in September. Okay. So I said that at the beginning if you were listening, but <laughs> I was. I was it's a horrible audience. Right. So <laughs> how long? How have? What have you seen change? So when I first got here, it was probably coming towards the end of the golden packages, right? So mm-hmm. paying well overs for people to relocate here. Yeah. And that was a huge thing. People were getting villas and were getting company cars and you know, 40, 50K a month more than what they were worth. Wow. Is that just because supply was low, demand was high or? It was hard to, commu- to, to convince people that this was a place to live with your family. Dubai hadn't established its name as it, it has now? It was nowhere near what it is now. Okay. Right? Whereas now, nine years on, I can kid you not, we don't even have to try to sell it. This is the place to be. People yeah. just want to come. Yeah, for, yeah. for so many different reasons. Of Forget about the, you see all the rubbish on LinkedIn from all the lesser sort of recruitment companies. I won't name them, all right? <laughs> but um, uh, I'll talk there. about move to Dubai, it's, you know, 24 hours sunshine. Yeah. In July, are you happy? Yeah. No. <laughs> <In the sunshine? laughs> That's no, what you don't right? want sunshine. So um, these little things, they, they matter to the people who don't really think it through. Yeah. Okay. The things that matter are 
if you have a family, the safety for your wife and kids. Of course. Yes, absolutely. Okay, the fact that they can walk anywhere, anytime, and nothing will happen to them. Yeah. yeah. And coming from other states or Oz, that's a huge thing yep. to actually yeah. value, yeah. right? Now, if you want to go more personal from a practicing Muslim, being able to pray anywhere without having rocks thrown at my head is a, is a win in my book. Absolutely. Okay? Going into any building and there'll be a musallah there, going into any park and just laying down a mat and then people will just come and tap you on the shoulder and join your prayer. Yep. That stuff gives you, still gives me goosebumps. Yeah. Because that won't happen in Oz. Of people will be like, oh, I can't pray here because there, there are less people over there who are drinking and they might say something and so forth, right? Whereas here, you don't get that. Even the so, food. Well, so, I'm, so I'm different for the food, right? Yeah. Because in Oz and in our community in Melbourne, we are, you know, if it's, it doesn't necessarily have to always come from the halal butcher to eat it, right? We say, say this, we eat it. Yeah. All right? Yeah. Whereas my mates from the UK, that they come yeah. here and they're like, Oh man, we can now eat like you know proper food. Mm. I'm like, what do you mean? Like we only eat chicken. But that's cultural, right? Well, not really. Because like, from it's... Sydney, I find. I mean, from Sydney personally, everyone that I know, if it's not halal, they will not eat. That's really? What we yeah, say. yeah, yeah. In Sydney, yeah. It, look, Sydney and Melbourne got. I found that Sydney. I think probably after 9/11, there was this rejuvenation of a revival of of the religion, right? And all of a sudden, where people used to just say Bismillah. Right, mm-hmm. as it's good enough. Because we used to do that too right? when we were yeah. younger. All of a sudden, that's that sh- that people changed, and by the time I left, you know, there were hardcore Muslims who just would not eat anything unless it was, you know, the halal. And in fact, that they would, would go to a halal butcher yeah. and and, and question yeah, it. and question. Yeah, so like, do you have your certificate? Do no, you have it's this? Not, it's you not know? even the certificate. Like they they bicker, the butchers bicker between each other and the suppliers, whether it's hand slaughtered. Whether it's machine okay, slaughtered, yeah. the whether it's stunned, yeah. you but know, whether it's... But we're also okay. just, and this is so off topic, but just since it came up, just, you know, for our listener who's listening, they understand, we're, con- we're, we're mixing up the words halal and zabiha, right? Like zabiha is the meat that's slaughtered by a Muslim person who says, Bismillah, Allah, yeah. before he slaughters. Halal food is any meat that comes from people of the book. So Muslim Christians and Jews, and yeah. I think I was the same way in America. And it sounds like, like that's the way you were in, in yeah, New yeah, York, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So like, it doesn't have to be that like, hey, this came from a Muslim butcher, but you know, Chick Fil A, for example, in America, this is a Christian establishment. So this is this is halal. Like Islam says, this is halal. Now we have people who you know go to these. I don't want to say extremes and judge them, but like, oh, how did they kill it? How did they do? Were the animals treated humanely? All those kind of stuff. But we can say the same thing about Muslim men. I've seen Muslim butcher shops and they've got Bismillah Akbar just playing on a, on a loop <laughs> and the butchers are in the background <laughs> getting drunk. Like, oh, I don't have to do anything. They're just getting drunk. And we're like, oh, this is halal. This is halal. So there is like a little confusion. Yeah, look, anyway, it's off topic, but I just thought I'd mention for people who are listening. Well, it's the, it's the, um, the running gag from growing up. We had all like the Muslim boys growing up in our area and so forth that, you know, in their sort of, you know, their forming years, their late teenage, early 20s, obviously they're going out, they're drinking and so forth. And it comes to the, at the end of the night, they go to a, to a hot dog van. I can't eat that, bro. Yeah, That's yeah. Not hey, halal. Can't eat, Dude, can't you were just grinding. It's pork. It's pork. You just slept with two birds and your, and your shit face and now you can't eat that hot dog? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. the limit. That's the limit, man. That's, what that, that, <laughs> That's the line. Can't cross that That's line, bro. That's what I draw the line. Can't do it. But in their defense, man, when you eat something, this is so bad, but when you eat something haram, there's no benefit. Right, yeah. but like if you do something like one of these, like, like there's some uh, benefit you enjoy, whatever. <laughs> oh, yeah, so it's like uh, that's yeah. how I always. Yeah. My yeah. friends were the same way. Honestly, what's the rating right? on this podcast, by the way? Because like I don't we can go this. Yeah, there's no. Yeah, yeah. We're rating. gonna ask you something. I want to go back for a second. Okay, so packages are gone, right? Yeah, packages you are said gone. A hundred percent. So yeah. me and Ali are not in the corporate world. Just okay. so you know, we both. Yeah. He has his job, mashallah, back in Australia. Yeah. I have my my work back in America. Yeah. So this is just like a home base for us. Okay. But our work is there. So we've neither one of us have been in the corporate world before. So a lot of this stuff we've heard it and we've seen it, but we haven't actually lived it. Yeah. But we do um, have people that constantly ask us, "How do I get to Dubai?" It's a daily daily you know? question. Whether I tell them Priceline.com. Like what the hell? It's so yeah. easy. <laughs> I'm I'm at that point where I say, look, better to start a business, you know, freelancing. That's the easiest way to get in. But I don't know if that's the right way. Depends right? on their skill set. Yeah. It depends on their right. experience, right? right? Their background. Well, very so, few people can start their own business. I mean, that's like. I mean, you would you would agree everyone. to that, yeah. 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 But it's not for everyone. Can you yeah. agree there are more barriers to entry uh, in opening a business in the UAE compared to, say, Australia? For example, you got your trade license. That's a great. You got question. your yearly what? auditing fees. So, 
the barriers are just the financial sort of outlay that you need to actually set up here compared yeah. to back home when you pay $120 for an ABN number and then Correct. away you go, right? Whereas here, it's 12500 for a trade license with, with LLC per year. Yeah. per year. Then you've got your, your service office, your, um, you know, your Ejari and, and all yep. sort of stuff. And your visas. Well, right? and the all visas of your... and then the medical insurance and everything like that. So there's, a, there's more of an initial outlay to be able to set no, up But there also certain industries that you sort of you, like, I know that's sort of changed now, but there's certain industries where it would be adv advantageous to have a local partner. Like, say you want to get to the tax So that industry. rule went out, right? So probably yeah. three years ago, um, anything on an LLC, you needed to have a local sponsor, okay? That was removed now, so mm -hmm. now any expat can actually have an, an LLC, so. In um, any part of the UAE? Any not part. just free zones. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about Dubai and I'm talking about, you know, um, uh, what the laws are with the DED license or with the, anything else. And again, okay. there are far better people who know a, a hell of a lot more on this topic than I do. I mean, I've set up a DED in the past like, with my LLC, with my company and so forth. But I know people who have got free zones with DMCC or free zones with, you know, Silicon Oasis and so forth, which is actually quite easy to do. And again, but then the, it's just the price. The ease of it is... You find like a third party company, um, uh, like Strive, you know, a good friend of mine, Pally, who actually runs that sort of business and they do all the company setups. Nice. Um, and you've got others like that. So you, you go to them and say, do it all, you pay them a fee and then they do everything for you. And then all you're doing is just paying. That's the biggest hurdle for you in setting yep. up a company. I mean, I've got guys in Oz who are in property who are now coming here doing properties and they've set up their property companies, right? They've got their Silicon Oasis trade license as property investors or real estate and so forth. And they're leaving their money here from Oz because they're making their investments and rather than sending it back home and Taxed. getting um, ripped by the, by the government, <laughs> they're le leaving it here. And they're slowly, slowly establishing a, a base here now because this is where the market is. Yep. This is where the world is, right? Yep. We're, we're in the center right now. It's so the hub, right? It is the hub. Yes. And it, it's the hub that encourages people to actually do something with their lives, right? That's the difference between here and, and back home, I believe. Yeah, because you get the flexibility in terms of Simple things like nanny, for example, um, you know, drop offs. You can easily hire a driver here if you want a full time driver for the family. Um, you know, everything opens late, so if you put the kids to bed and you have a babysitter, you and the missus can go out and enjoy. That's one thing this. that I notice when I, when I go back home is that it's almost like life closes it's, it's, at six p.m. Definitely, right? because and and if you can't get things done in that sort of limited time frame. You're screwed. Yep. Like, well, you I mean, the banks, I mean, the banks close at four. Yeah. You have to wait until the weekend. You have to sacrifice your weekend. Sacrifice your weekend just to, do, uh, to run errands. Yeah. Well, I mean, you the bank I mean? closes at four, right? So how do you do any, uh, how do you do any exactly. banking? How do you, so unless you're willing to. Even a barber, right? Yeah. Which is a barber, by the way. A barber. Uh, yeah. barber. Hairdresser. Yeah. Hairdresser. Yeah. Hairdresser. Yeah. Haven't been to yeah. one in a while, but yeah. yes, I am familiar with them. <laughs> for, the, for the fade, you know yeah. what I mean? Even well, well, in Oz, they don't work Sundays, they don't work Mondays, they close at, at like 2 p.m. I'm just like, hang on a second. Yeah. I go to mine at 10.30 sometimes. Right, right. P.m. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, because you can yeah, here. Yeah. So yeah. that flexibility to be able to do those sort of things here. And then the, the, the sort of entrepreneur ecosystem here is actually quite unique compared yeah. to every, everywhere else in the world. Is still quite in its infancy stage when it comes to the sort of fundamentals around it and the foundations around it, but there's a lot of potential for it to just explode. But the government just needs to show some more flexibility around how they support you mm. because, let's be honest, small businesses, they fail because of cash flow. Yes. 100%. More often than not, right? Yeah. And the payment uh, sort of world here, you know, <laughs> the, it's... So far behind, man. It's ridiculous. Well, I, mean, I think right? just the banking, right? Just little things like the wrong description can get your account blocked. You know the. <laughs> so when I when I sold my stake in one business, my previous business before I, I launched um, ARC Arc Talent. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, We're gonna change I, that name. I, I think ARC sounds better, man. I it's in gonna... all caps, man. That's what threw me off. So that's what threw me off. I apologize. Man. That's alright, man. That's alright. I clearly like didn't it. do it's enough like research. Is it at space? It's gonna be A space R. I don't like Arc. You're gonna woo. You know, but I think on the trade line it's A dot R dot C. Is it is really? I think it is. So, so even more, right, even yeah, more. So right. But um, when I when I left that business because I was the managing partner for this firm and I was the signatory on the bank, right? But on my visa, I was an employee because I was on just like employed yeah. on the visa and so yeah, forth, yeah. right? When I changed, so when I cancelled that visa and set up my own company and then I became partner on my visa, right? my accounts were frozen for 70 days yeah wow. and they didn't know so it wasn't the 70 days frozen it was 
they didn't know why it was frozen and they couldn't unfreeze it. Yep. So I was sitting in my in a meeting and I got like a message saying all my money got had had been withdrawn from my account. Yes. And then ten seconds later it got put into my account and then my then ten seconds later my account was frozen. I'm like, I'm leaving this meeting. I go, sorry, I have to leave. Something has just happened and so forth. And it was all like the, the, the payout from the from the previous company, my buyout and so forth, that I had put money into the company. All this thing was all there and all my life savings. This was two or three months before my third child was due. And I was like, what am I going to do here? This is an absolute disaster. Yeah, for sure. No money in Dubai means you are screwed. Yeah. Okay, simple yeah. as that. The right? bills no keep coming there. here. The bills there's, don't stop. There's no, you know, pleading with the government to get some extensions on payments. Like <laughs> right, 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 right. And it can take like a that, while right? to, for them to unfreeze. Yeah, 100%. And a lot of times right. people already have checks. Like you've already written yeah, yeah, checks yeah. for the exactly, year or right? something like that. So call centers, branches, call centers, branches, like 70 days. Whilst having launched a new company, I was like, this is just doing my absolute head in. And lucky I had good friends around me that were just spotting me 50 grand, 70 grand for rent or for something that was coming out and, and so forth. But, and then in the end, I said to them, they, they figured it out, they unfroze it. Do you want me to name the bank or not? No. But Are we shaming them? No, no we don't. We're not, not shaming them. You can tell us later yeah. so we can put our money out. Cli- it could be a client of mine. So. Yeah. <laughs> could be some defamation there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So they... They call me into the branch. I, I go in there and I said, I was more curious about what was the problem. Right. And they said, Listen, wait for it. You change your status from employee to business owner. The, the, the bank didn't know what to do with that. So the automatic default was freeze. It's crazy. It's like a panic button. Yeah. Oh shit, what's going on? Just stop. He's changed his visa status. I said, surely. I am not the only person or the first person the who has gone from salary to employee to a business owner in the UAE that made you do this and took you 70 days to realize this was the reason why it had been frozen. And there's no compensation. There's no, no nothing at all. There's no there's remedies, nothing right? That, hey, no. look, I've had, to, uh, I've had to borrow money or I've had to do this. I'd they be on a care. current affair with a, with a NAB if it was in, if there, it was in Australia. I mean, that's what I'd, I'd do a whole campaign to try and bring up <laughs> bring down the no, bank. I mean, the, the, and sue them yeah. and, and, and get <laughs> God how much The money, financial right? ombudsman, um, if yeah. they need to re- remedy an, an issue with the, between you and the bank in Australia, normally the bank pays you some compensation. I have a couple of friends got paid five, ten thousand dollars. Yeah, hundred percent. Because the banks the inconvenience. did a bank guarantee yeah. incorrectly, or yeah. the settlement date was missed because they missed the settlement and. They compensated them. They had they they were remedied for the loss. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I think that's almost impossible to get remedied. We take a lot of losses here, especially parking fines, right? And traffic <laughs> violations. <laughs> Just um going on your earlier point, so you obviously you know, since you're a headhunter, yep. are there specific areas around the world that you I guess prefer isn't the word, but are there certain areas that you target to bring people to the UAE? Like are there certain nationalities that sell better with employers or are there certain you know, specialties that work that are more conducive to the UAE. Yeah, for what's, example. what's what's hot right now? Yeah. So, the biggest cultural shock for me was when I first came here. The the open racism and classism was was real here, mm. right? So, yeah. going into a client briefing and a client telling me, "I don't want any Indians or Pakistanis," and I was like, "What? <laughs> um, you can't say that." Like. Because I'm from Oz. Right, yeah. right. If you, you can't say that, say that. you're shut down. Yeah. Yeah. Like, 100%. There's no way you're Us still too, getting of course, away with yeah, that. Same yeah. thing in America. 100%. Of course, right? yeah. any, any Western society is going to shut that down straight away. And I asked my colleague you know, um, at that time, I'm like, he can't say that, right? Like, and he's like, oh, it's, it's, they, they put it down to if there's too many of them, it forms cliques in their culture and so forth. So they want to diversify that way. Okay? Yeah. But really, you can see through the ones who are doing it for the right reasons and doing it for the wrong reasons. Yeah, for sure. Right? So when it comes to us, we asked a question, which would never happen in my previous 17, 18 years in Oz. What nationality would you like? Okay. Almost like an e-commerce off the shelf. What um, do you and, want and, them to come from the subcontinent? And that's legal, right? Because I've seen a lot of job ads saying Filipino or Indian or South Asian. So, I, so I, I still think that's wrong. Okay. I don't think you should be labeling it what... Um, you can have a preference during your process that if you've found someone from Egypt as opposed to Jordan and, and you believe that the Egyptian person will fit better within your culture, mm. then you have the right to feel that way. But when you label your, your vacancy as I'm looking for a Filipino assistant or I'm looking for a you know, Russian salesperson 
unless they need to speak Russian because that's the market that of you're course. looking to go after, then yeah. that's different, right? That's justifiable. Everything else is just, come on, you're, this is a bit sort of the gray area for me, which I'm not comfortable with, yeah. right? But to go then to answer your question about what, what is hot or where we're going, I mean, look, for me, tech talent is everything, right? So whether they come from South Africa because they're great there, the creative design um, uh, candidates come from South America. So anywhere, Colombia, you know, Brazil, Argentina, fantastic. Well, Tech nice. in Argentina as well is fantastic. Um, the things with people in America is, obviously you guys still pay tax, right? So they don't have the benefits that Aussies have or the Brits have where they, they come here and they live tax free. They're still gonna pay their percentage of tax even though they're living here, which is again, it's mind boggling. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Even you happens, know, there's only right? two countries that do that, by the way. The US, and you'll never guess the second one, and I'm going to mispronounce it, but Eritrea. Oh, really? The only that two that countries country. that tax their citizens, even if, like, any money that they make all of their life, as long as you have a US passport, they tax you wherever you are, however insane, you made your money. Right? Wow. Can you imagine? No, Can you imagine I can't. I mean, what's the advantage then? Why would you leave? Why would you leave? Yeah. Maybe yeah. just for the safety then and the oh. that lifestyle. But if I still had to pay tax, well, I think you, well, I think country. you can give up your passport, right? Then you can sort of avoid that. But then obviously, good luck getting it back. Yeah, well, you well, you're not going to get it back. You're never going to get it back. You won't get it back. Oh yeah, yeah true, yeah. true. Yeah, because they're hundred yeah. percent. You can't live here. Some yeah. countries you can. Yeah. You can completely. Well, look, there's, there's no there's no sort of right or wrong answer to that question by saying they have to come from here because they do well or anything like that. Like, look at the diversified cultures here. Right, mm -hmm. there's just so many. Go to your kids' schools and, and, and look at how many different nationalities are actually in their classrooms. Well, that's the thing. You, like, I mean, I know with my kids' school, I can't tell you which nationality dominates the, let's say, population or the number of kids because they're literally all from different nationalities. Yeah. You know? So I can't say there's more Lebanese or more Russians or more Argentinians. It's just a very nice mix. And I feel like that's good for the kids. You know? like my kids come home and say, my friend does this for his birthday party. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, my friend bought this type of lunch, you know, it's like, oh, okay, you know, so it's, it's also good, I think, for the kids to be exposed to that. So, so I notice coming, being here for nine years, my, all my kids have been raised here. And then when I go back home, I notice a difference in the kids in Oz, as opposed to my kids based on their sort of just, their social awareness, their social skills, their ability to sort of just you know um, uh, adapt to certain environments or different no, cultures. but even express themselves right yeah i feel well, like our course. kids here express of themselves course. a lot better than sometimes you go back to us like like not doesn't mean like the kids are not smart but just i feel like here the schooling uh, you know encourages that you know get outside of their comfort zone you know uh, do their own assignments but it's also their lives yeah their lives true but, but they have you compared to back home again it's it's school it's home it's, it's with their cousins with their relatives in their neighboring streets and whatever it may be and that's it they're not going to sky zones and this and then going to tramp um, uh, things you know every single um, uh, weekend for a birthday party this person's house this person's place center whatever it may be you know just just networking with people. They're networking. Yep. Yeah, that's, but, that's what they're doing. But what does that lead to us? So then when you start uni or you start your first job, it's a culture shock, right? You're not, you're not prepared for the real world. If you're always dealing with, for example, Lebanese, because I'm Lebanese, or Syrians only, you're not open to other cultures. You don't understand, you know, that, I don't know, that guy needs to, you know, leave early. Like, not leave early, just everyone's got a different way of doing things. I think people, when, say, for example, the UAE, when people land in, in the Dubai airport and they see the locals wearing... Their traditional clothing, I generally believe because I used to think this that they're just wearing it for fun, and then as you stay here, like that's actually what they wear every single day. Every day. And in Australia, I think and it, people and are so shocked. Yeah, right. <laughs> of course, it's comfortable. Yeah. I mean, I prefer to wear yeah, that, but I, <laughs> I just can't pull it off can as well you, as can they. You get one. I've got a custom made one, bro. I did two of them. The guy was a, the guy did a great job. He they have to import the fabric, <laughs> special made on these huge rolls. <laughs> so, but back something. when yeah, you go look for somebody, when you look for somebody, right? Um, and obviously, I know you're at your company's headhunters, but you probably also get reactive. You get resumes. Yeah, too many. Too many, right? Yeah. But do, I wanted to ask, do you have out. a grab bag of people? So when somebody comes and says, hey, Abdurrahman, we're looking for I love the a word tech grab person. Bag. Yeah, I, I, I didn't bag. know what yeah. to say. Yeah. I've been thinking about Tele the question. Telepools are, are the are <laughs> yeah. common terminology, but like, grab bag is a new thing now. Okay. okay. We're, we're, we're going to use that from out. now on. What stands out? I'm getting old, bro. I don't know. <laughs> Look, we, we have talent pools. We have you know people that we regularly speak to and so forth and, and keep in contact with because we know... We may not be placing them today, but they're good enough that some one of our clients will want them in, say, two months' time or six months' time and mm -hmm. so forth. So we always try and stay close to those sort of candidates, and that could be in 
all different verticals and different sort of fields, right? So, you know, the, the top 10 in marketing, the top 10 in, in, the, in engineering, in crypto, in, you know, um, uh, data and so forth, right? Mm. Just, just keep on talking to them. That's how you build a network and, and of really good people because the idea is if you as a company come to me and you need someone, speed is everything, yep. all right? And then couple that with the quality. So if I take five weeks to come to you with, a, with two or three profiles and they're meh, you're never going to want to talk to me again. For sure. But if I come to you in two or three days with some amazing people, you're going to say, this guy knows his stuff, right? Mm. So we need to have them ready. Keep and how those. are you finding these people? I'm sure it's, it's not Dubizzle or Craigslist, right? How are you finding Look, when you're headhunting? <clears throat> I'm going to go on a, on, on a limb here and I'm going to say something that's going to be quite controversial. We love okay? that. We love we that. Love Get that. ready for the so views, baby. <laughs> every, every recruiter out there who tries to sell that they do something different to the next are absolutely 100% lying. No one does anything different. Everyone uses LinkedIn. We are slaves to that platform, mm -hmm. right? Because that is where everyone is. And that's where you have access to be able to reach anyone that you need to in the in global market. Okay. So you sort of preempted my question. So obviously there's multiple companies or many companies that do headhunting. What makes you guys stand out or a little bit different? You mentioned at the start of the pod, you guys bring the human element into yep. it more. So since like pretty much using your own words, most of the companies rely on LinkedIn. So what, what allows you to choose the best candidate? What do you guys do a little bit? Obviously, no, don't give you any way trade secrets or anything, yeah, but. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to. Um, uh, <laughs> because again, it, it, it's no real secret if you, if you, if you pay attention to it. Right? So, it's a, who are we going to use? podcast where we've been recording. What are you talking about? <laughs> this guy. This is recording, right? Yeah. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> I thought you wanted to hang out. Devil, record, <laughs> devil recording. <laughs> well, we don't want to call out our man back here. But we did have a few weeks ago where we recorded for a whole hour, a yeah. whole episode. And then he comes and he looks. He's like, oh, man, it wasn't recording. Oh, no and, way. And we had to redo it. And the second episode, we love the guy, man, so no hate to him. <laughs> but the second episode, it was the same thing. It just, it just wasn't as good as the first one. It couldn't one. have been yeah. as, so as, a, as good. So it's a semi-legitimate yeah. question. Okay. Are we recording? <laughs> Can we check we this? We should double check. <laughs> yeah, let's Can take a time out. <laughs> so let me answer it in two ways, yeah. okay? So on, on the tool that we use, which is LinkedIn, um, if we had three Formula One cars lining up together, right? And the keys were given to you, the keys are given to you, and the keys were given to Verstappen. Okay. To who? Verstappen, the driver. Yeah. Okay. From the. Oh, sorry, yeah. sorry. Yeah, yeah. The okay. Formula F1. Yeah. So you got three cars there. You try and drive. You try and drive, and then then he drives. Who's gonna win that race? Verstappen. Okay. Yeah. I'll be but, throwing up from what I hear. Yeah. <laughs> the guy who knows how to use the tool. Yeah. Right. So everyone has access to LinkedIn. They can pay for a premium. They can pay for a recruiter license and so forth. We stand out in our mind because we use the tool really well. We know how to use it. We have a high response rate on our LinkedIn. The average is roughly around sort of 13, 18%, okay, for a response rate. So that means one, in, um, one or two in every 10 messages are gonna come with a reply and saying, hey, thanks for reaching out to me and so forth. The other eight or eight and a half, crickets. Yeah. You, you won't hear everything, right? Ours is roughly around 78% response rate. Wow. So, based, very so based on the, on how we use it, right? On, on how we use, how we do our searches, the messaging that we use and so forth to be able to grab their attention. This is the first part of it. Okay. So that is the tool using part of our job. Yeah. The second part is the human side. Every opportunity that we sell, if we don't buy into the client, we don't work with that client if we don't understand their culture and why they are looking for this person and what it means to have this person in their business and the impact it will have in their, in their business for having the right person and so forth. And if we don't, or if we're not convinced that the client is not passionate about the human element of business, we walk away. Yeah. And then if all those boxes are ticked off, we go to market and we sell that. The package is the last thing that we mentioned right at the very end when we've already got the buy-in from the candidate. Yeah. We've sold them, not a dream. We're not looking to try and manipulate them, to try and convince them. Once we feel that we are trying to convince a candidate, we back away from that candidate. Yeah. Because if the candidate's um, giving us red flags, and we know them all, right? The guy's looking to see whether or not he can move abroad, but he hasn't spoken to his wife. If you haven't had that conversation 
now You're and fine. then what are the chances that you're going to go to your wife at dinner and say hey a headhunter called me and said I'm going to move abroad well, for this job can we go yeah well, no worries we'll, we'll pack tomorrow well did you conv- you went, you didn't convince your wife ever not I know with my wife she was it took me months to convince her you know to because they want to stay with their family I mean I'm just if, guessing if my wife watches this she'll, she'll like cringe at me saying this but if you saw me at Melbourne Town Marine Airport, you would have thought I was kidnapping my wife. <laughs> That's what I <laughs> to mean. To the point that, that the security guard came up to us and asked us whether we were okay. She was not wanting to come here, mate. Yeah. At all. Now, fast forward nine years, if you wanted me to take her back to Australia, no. you would think that I was kidnapping her to go <laughs> yeah. back to Australia because right, she right. does not want to go back home. Yeah, of right? course. So, but I don't know if you guys have the same feeling like when you recommend a restaurant, for example, to a friend. It's like a stressful situation. Like, what if they go and they don't enjoy it? What if I just happen to have a great experience? What if they just happen to have a bad experience? So does that play in part at all when you, when you bring somebody, when you recruit somebody and you say, here you, go, here you guys go, I've vetted this of course, person. Of course. What's going to happen in two or three months? And I, I think back to our first few minutes when you said you took a job and you didn't go. My bad you experience. You took a job and you, you, yeah. you left and it. And it happens, doesn't and, it? Yeah, of course it so, does, right? And we can get wronged. We can get bamboozled by a client oh, for sure. who like, tells us it's X, Y, Z. And then when the candidate walks in, it, it's A, B, C. That's X, Y, Z for our American listeners. Yes, exactly right. <laughs> for all 15 of them. You know, um, you know, so like, um, the rest of the world says Z. But we'll, yeah. we'll, uh, exactly. I said American, man. I, I, was, I was calling out <laughs> yeah. our deficiencies. You hold it, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm well aware. It is, it, is, it is such a... This is where, again, I've probably said it like seven times so far, the human side of it, right? Um, we can't ignore the human side in everything that we do in business, mm-hmm. right? Because it's not just a transaction of saying, this guy's got the amazing skill set and he, he fits within the culture of the business, so I'm going to just put him through and so forth. And in the end, I'm going to make money off this because I'm going to send him an invoice and it's going to be a significant amount because he's getting paid a lot. Therefore, I'm getting paid a lot. Happy days. We're all going to be celebrating. And I don't really care. And the reality is there are too many agencies out there, too many bad apples in our industry that as long as he passes his probation, they don't give a shit. Yeah. Right? They just want their cut. And that makes it hard for us. Of course. For the ones who actually care, that makes it really hard because those clients and those candidates have been burnt so many times and then that spreads like wildfire because bad experiences spread a hell of a lot worse than good experiences. For sure. So when they get done over by that recruiter who only cares about as long as you pass your three or six month probation and, and as long as I don't have to do the free replacement, then how else? I yeah. wash my hands from yeah. this responsibility because I'm an invoice chaser in the yeah. end, right? Yeah. But when you're not an invoice chaser and, and when you want to be a partner with a client and therefore you care about the client and their culture so much that you're invested in there and you almost become like a brand ambassador for them. And at the same time, when you're talking to candidates, you want that candidate to fit in for so many different reasons, right? For so many different reasons. It's so important to you because, the, because that person's impact onto that culture is massive, but on the flip side of that, the company and the culture's impact to that person's life is even more impactful. So if we get it wrong because of negligence, then how do I sleep at night? For sure. And like I'm not I'm not a mufti, I'm not a chef, right? But I'm a God fearing man and I've gone through hell and back in this dunya to, to, to know what's important, yeah? yeah? And to know what I'm responsible for. And to know that as a leader in business and a leader in, in general, that I'm gonna be accountable for, for how I behave. <clears throat> but right? it's also a pride thing, right? Because you're, you, you wanna represent yourself and your business in a certain way. Of like, course. I know with Karim's business, I mean, I can say this without even confirming it, and with my business, like everything we put out there, we wanna be proud of. I'm not gonna put something out there that I'm not yeah, proud 100%. of because it can always come back on you and reflect really, really badly. So that's big respect, you know, for having that at the forefront of, yeah, of your that, business, yeah. you know? Look, it, it, it's the only way. Like, I've been lucky enough to work with some really good leaders over my career that have sort of hammered this home from a, from a very sort of young age in my career where nice. they, they, they... And I was naturally inclined to be a cowboy salesperson mm. because I was a salesperson always, right? So that gunslinger who just picks up the phone and does deals, the Wolf of Wall Street sort of scene, the beat in the chest and so forth. Yeah, it, it, it's all fun when you're in your 20s. But once you start getting a little bit older and you, and you get the grease and the, the grays in your beard, <laughs> not in your, in your hair, you start realizing that there's more to it. There's a long-term relationship that I could speak to you today and have nothing to do with business and then just build that rapport. And three years time, we end up crossing paths again and then do business, whether I'm helping you or you're helping me. Yeah. 
that's where the human connection is the most important, right? So I'm meeting a candidate tomorrow that I almost placed five and a half years ago. Wow. Okay? wow. And we speak once every year and he's now in town and we're having coffee tomorrow morning. But the last time I was like proper hammering him to try and relocate him was five and a half years ago. Oh. And, and we're meeting for the first time tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Wow. Abdurrahman, right. if you don't mind, just in our last few minutes here, yeah. uh, just you know, for our listeners to understand and to just get a better idea, with your background, what are the recommendations that you have for somebody who's looking, I, I want to say specifically coming to the UAE, but I think that like your suggestions could probably be more broad as well. What are your suggestions for, for them to do on LinkedIn with their CV? What should they be doing? What calls should they be making? Like, what's that process look like? Because yeah. I, it's been so long. I mean, last time yeah. I applied for a job, man, I was a teenager, alhamdulillah, yeah. for everything. Yeah. Yeah. And so it was just like, no, at that time, we were handing well, in. I know a lot, of people. I know a lot yeah. of people who are desperate to come to the UAE, yeah. highly skilled in Australia, as an example, and other parts of the world. Yet they are struggling to get responses Okay. Right on LinkedIn. Yeah. Right? It's crickets, as you said. Yeah, because their skills don't always translate. I think we overvalue some of their skills. what makes them stand out? So so they're not getting responses. But not in a bullshit way. Yeah, Yeah, right. We don't want them to just, hey, bold your name. No, no, no. We're not looking for that. They won't get responses because people in our industry don't like the 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 in-mails. Okay, we don't respond to applications. Yeah. If we put up a job ad, it's not because we want people to apply. Really? Simple. Don't apply for jobs, never again, because you won't get a response. So, so why, the, do, you, why do you post Is them? it just a t- tick a box? People, people put up job ads, groundbreaking stuff, because of branding. They show the world we have these jobs on to entice right. people to think about their own brand and so forth. It's horrible. Job ads mean nothing. Yeah. Don't put them up. Don't, don't put your CV through there. And it's so easy on LinkedIn. Apply now, bang, 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 it's done. Mm-hmm. Right? You can do 100 in an hour. Yeah. Yeah. All right. It's just, it's pointless. Why are we applying for jobs? A mate of mine has set up a business called No Bueno. Okay. And No Bueno is a Tinder for job hunting. You create your profile and then you'll match the jobs and you swipe left or right pretty much on whether or not you want to be considered for that job. That sounds amazing. That's the best thing, right? Yeah. So, so we're, so we're in, the, in the middle. I'm joining him now to try and do some things with it as well and so forth. So it's very exciting. And, and, that's the best way forward. In relation to the profile, CVs, they're dead. CVs are only used in a point of reference in the interview process. Who wants to look through three or four pages of CVs? I've always wondered that, you know, it's just yeah. tedious. There's no need for it, right? Anyone who reaches out to me on, uh, on WhatsApp, and I get so many people who said, I got your number of so-and-so, I'm looking for a work, or you know, my husband this, or my wife this, whatever it may be, and so forth. It's, it's, it happens too often. For sure. Okay? And they say to me, can I send you my CV? Send me your, your LinkedIn profile. That's all I want to see. Okay, then with that point, that yeah. means like a girl putting makeup on, the people that want to find jobs, their LinkedIn profile has is to everything, be... Is every- everything, is everything, is so, everything. It's your, best, your personal website. So what turns you off from, let's say you've got 100 no, profiles. No photo. Okay. If you don't have a photo, you don't exist. Okay. Okay, that's the first thing. If you have a horrible photo, you don't exist in my eyes. Okay. Because what are you doing? If you can't take the care to, to really um, uh, put a nice photo of yourself where we can see your face, not with a couple of beers and some sunglasses there saying, hey, look at me with a yacht behind you and so forth. Yeah. Keep that for Facebook. For sure. Okay? For LinkedIn, a nice photo where we, where we can see what you look like and so forth. Because it's important. It's the human face behind the name, behind your, your profile, your <clears throat> experience and so forth. For sure. Right? So we need to see that. And then, then the specifics that you like to put on your CV should be on your LinkedIn. LinkedIn is now your digital CV. Everyone who we send to our, to, to our clients, there's no chance they're not checking their LinkedIn profile. For sure. And they're cross-referencing to see whether or not. And you wouldn't believe how many people's CV don't even match their, their LinkedIn profile. Wow. The dates wow. are off. Yeah. The, the jobs aren't even there. Okay. Some jobs are removed from their CV, but they're still on their LinkedIn or vice versa. Okay. Are they checking sure. social media channels as well? Is that a thing? Or so I, that's what I heard. That yeah, they look. So I think that's big in the states, but I don't know it, how big it is. It was here. big in Oz once. So I remember one girl. She was running a big account for Nespresso, and um, she had this very raunchy sort of photo with some sh- bottles of champagne in Oz, 
and she lost a multi million dollar account with, um, uh, with that brand wow. because they didn't because on her thing it had underneath on her Facebook it had working with Nespresso and so forth and, and Nespresso called up and said listen we can't have that that's not for our sort of brand for our demographic for our target audience and so forth cut wow. and wow. that's it right so I haven't heard too many stories like that here I mean I've heard more because of the whole sort of gender stuff and you know the you know the rainbow uh, thing isn't really prominent here right so but i've heard some people who have come from abroad and have had their sort of pronouns here and so forth they've been sort of shut down straight away yep. right? yeah so can i ask a question for uh, regarding degrees so <laughs> in australia and even us you yeah. can get through without a degree right yeah. experience matters yeah but here in the uae i got told they won't even look at you yeah many times without it that's degree. wrong that's wrong like my my visa that statement is wrong, or the fact that they don't look at it is wrong. The statement is wrong. Okay, he's so, wrong a lot. Yeah. So that's what I mean. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because if you look at their ads, they're always asking for. They always the ask. Yeah. And then when we take the brief, and then we say to them, if if they don't have a degree, but you find someone who's fantastic, are you going to hire them? Absolutely. Okay, that's the nice. reality. My visa had to say archive clerk because I have no degree, so mm. they couldn't make me a GM or like an MD and so forth because I don't have a. De- but that's changing. Degree, that's, right? changing now, right? that's changing now as well, right? So, but like the, the qualification, unless that qualification is necessary for your job. Yeah, like a doctor or anything. Exactly, right? Then obviously you ain't getting the, <laughs> you ain't working <laughs> in medic clinic if you, if you don't have a degree, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I used to scalp. I was going to open up some sort of uh, psychology sort of uh, clinic sort of thing and just, uh, um, uh, just have those sort of therapy sessions with uh, some friends of mine. But like that sort of stuff in a degree, obviously. But like for, uh, you know, software engineers, you know, product designers, you know, marketeers and so forth. I mean, the reality is if you've got 10 years of experience working in marketing, you don't, you don't need a marketing degree. So if you're a person and you want to come to the UAE, you've said LinkedIn is, the ads are really useless. It's branding. Yeah. What's their, what's their path? Is it reaching out to recruiters? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that's where your message comes into it, right? Link, um, LinkedIn now has voice notes. So I would be doing voice notes to recruiters. Who's okay. paying the recruitment f- fee? Is it the, the company? The company that's recruiting. Yeah, the company. So somebody is looking for a job, and I know that probably sounds like such a, a you know stupid question, but the person who's looking for a job doesn't, doesn't have pay. to worry. Yeah, they don't. Yeah, I just wanted to make that yeah, point. Yeah, they don't. Because they, they don't pay. Yeah, so voice the company pays. Voice notes. <laughs> yeah, no, voice, notes. voice notes. This is nice. No, because no, I've had someone send a couple of messages to me, and I couldn't work out. That's how old I am. <laughs> how to send a voice back? You but, need to get right? rid of the flip phone. But think about th- think about. But is that a in- premium package or is that no, just no? Just, just, just think about the email that you get on LinkedIn, and it's just like, "Hi, how you going? I saw your profile. I saw some great jobs. Your company's growing. Looks fantastic. I'm very excited and so forth. I want to reach out to you. I'm looking to move abroad. Dubai looks like a great place to to live and work and so forth. I've already fallen asleep twice. Yeah. Okay. They've lost me already. But if I get a voice note that says, hey, saw your profile, really keen to, to connect, want to talk to you about what I'm doing, what I can bring to the table, what my value add proposition is to any organization that you're working with, I'm going to call that person right away. For sure. 100%. And do you, we only have a couple minutes left. Yeah. Uh, do you have a website that people can go do directly or they shouldn't reach out? That's the point, right? So, so my, website was, <laughs> my website was redesigned three years ago specifically and we, we put no jobs on the website. Okay. So no applicants. Okay. Right, because we have our own people, we we talk to them, we have followers on our on our LinkedIn page and so forth, one hundred and forty thousand, whatever it is, and so forth. So we we just com- communicate to them, we talk to them, and we just have that. But like yeah. anything else, no. Now I have something that may be a racist question. <laughs> if you asked a West, if you were look recruiting for uh, someone someone from the states or the US, there's always different values and how they you know. That they've, that they've worked in those comp- in, in that country, bringing them to an Eastern-run country, you know, environment may be a culture shock for them. Do you usually would like if you're if it's a Western country, you will prefer Western Westerners? Because I've had people who have come to Dubai working at an Eastern, whether it's Middle Eastern or an Indian or an Asian uh, company, and they've left within. Two to three months because of the. I can't take my shoes off yeah. at the door. I don't yeah. want to do that. Yeah. Or the yelling, the screaming. Look, the, you know. Again, it all falls down to understanding the culture and being completely like sort of eyes wide open when you're walking into that opportunity, right? Yeah. So as long as the headhunter is actually communicating this to you and is fully transparent about what you're walking into, 
then you can make that educated decision. If I had known what I was walking into with that company, yeah. I wouldn't have joined them, no matter how much money they were paying me, right? But I didn't know yeah. what it was because no one communicated that to me, neither them or the recruiter who, who actually put me forward to them. So that's a different thing. So as long as the headhunter sounds like he or she is actually communicating all the right things and not just the package and not just your job title, everything else that is really important, probably more important than those things that I just mentioned, yeah. then it doesn't typically happen where they walk out, um, they walk in and there's a big culture shock. Abdulrahman, just on a personal note, um, where do you see yourself in the business in five years? I'm sure that's a common thing you would ask the candidates. Well, when's this airing? Oh, man. How long? How long is <laughs> in it five years. In, in five years. Okay, so like, um, uh, so I, we can revisit our bloopers and yeah, say, oh, yeah, that was... Look, I, I see myself being, Shola, a, a sure. advisor to, to businesses away from the day-to-day -day of recruitment and talent acquisition and, and HR and more just, you know, whether sitting on boards or, you know, on, uh, running sort of, you know, seminars on how to build best practices in HR and talent frameworks and so forth. Because you've so, done seminars in Abu Dhabi, I saw on your... Yeah, I, I, I mentor, I, I, I do a lot of public speaking, which I really enjoy and so forth. And that, that if that is a sort of career path for me later on, then inshallah, I mean, whatever is written, man. Hey, and inshallah. UAE or Saudi, what's the... I'm, I'm, I'm open to both. Probably not relocate to Saudi just yet, but I'm, uh, I, I go there frequently because of business and so forth. But home is the UAE right now. Very nice. Cool. Abdurrahman, it's been such a pleasure. This is the first time I meet you, uh, just a few minutes before we pleasure, recorded, man. and such a pleasure, man. Such a pleasure to have you. I think we like we have so many, so much more to discuss. Actually, I wrote a whole bunch of questions, and Did I didn't get to. A, I didn't get to a single one. A single one. I Sorry, wanted to guys. hear success I stories. Ramble. I, I want to hear ramble. failure stories. Oh, I want to hear your crazy get stories. Get me back on. I would love to. I would love to. And inshallah, 100%. we will have you back on, man. This was inshallah, this man. was awesome. Just so you know, you're our first guest that we've had. Yeah. Um. So this was. Uh, I think it went pretty well. It was great. You have your podcast so that everybody can uh, subscribe and listen to that. Yep, steering you, success. Yep. Steering success. I got it, man. Yeah, I got it. Got I didn't it. forget. I got you, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, so definitely check out Steering Success. Uh, he's talking to people in the field. They tell great stories, success stories. And you touch on some of the stuff that we touched on as well. Yeah, yeah um, and, absolutely. And kind of guide. So if there's anybody out there looking for work, and it doesn't have to be necessarily in the UAE because a lot of the tips that you give are universal, Absolutely. Um, but definitely if you're looking for UAE, uh, Dubai specifically, uh, Saudi Arabia, you know, uh, he is your man. We thank you for coming on. We hope Pleasure, to see man. you again. This has been the TaskCast. Don't forget to like, subscribe, forward, share, do all that good stuff. Until next time, guys, we'll see you. TaskCast, live from Dubai.